Good morning, everyone. It's time to go on the record. Wow, can you believe this? Shock and awe. Boston 2024 moves ahead in the Olympic Games with the promises of transparency. We must have judgment to make our government as efficient, responsive, and innovative as it can be. The Charlie Baker era has begun. Beacon Hill's first test with the new guy in town, cutting $500 million. The speeches are over. It's time to get down to governing for Charlie Baker. We have voters' predictions. This is the last moment to turn back. <laughs> <laughs> the Massachusetts Senate has a witty new leader. The Senate President, Stan Rosenberg. He's our guest this morning on OTR. From WCPB Boston, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ed Harding, along with Mr. Five's political reporter, Janet Wu. Happy New Year to you. Thank you for joining us on OTR. It's been a huge week at the Bay State. Much to discuss this new year and this new day. We begin with the new Senate president on Beacon Hill, Stan Rosenberg. He's 65 years old, Democrat from Amherst. Has served in the House since 1991, a graduate of UMass in Amherst. Rosenberg makes history as the first Jewish and openly gay member to lead the Senate. And I have to ask you, did you did you script that line to Governor Baker or was this, did that just come off the top of it your head? It was totally spontaneous. Uh, you know, uh, it's a very serious uh, ceremony and it was starting to feel kind of heavy to me at that point and um, it just happened. Timing so is everything. I, I just couldn't delivered. control myself. Well, Happy New Year and thank you for joining us. I thank you and Happy New Year to you. And of course, you have been Senate President for all of less than one week, a half a week at this point. And you walked in the door <clears> and you face a lot of controversial issues. But before you even had a chance to move into your own offices, you find out the U.S. Olympic Committee is offering Boston as its nominee for the Olympics in 2024. Is this bottom line? I know you're probably joining the course. People are really happy that Boston is getting this recognition, but can this not cost taxpayers any money? Couldn't be happier. It's a prideful moment for Massachusetts and for Boston, uh, what we've been through, uh, and this establishes that we are truly a world-class city and world-class state. So to have been chosen is something we should be very proud of. Now we have to get into the public policy realm, and we have to take a look at this proposal with very, very careful eyes. The uh, organizers of this proposal say that we can do this without any public funds. They've modeled it, they say, after other places that have been successful in putting the whole Olympics together without touching public funds. So uh, we're going to put on the green eye shades, sharpen the pencils. <laughs> I'm going to bring in some experts, and we're going to sit <clears throat> with them, and we're going to go in, in great detail into the proposal to make sure that they really have a rock-solid proposal because we're really not in a position to come up with public funds to support this. The more immediate problem for you, however, is that half-billion-dollar deficit, roughly half-billion-dollar deficit. Are you willing to say, like Governor Baker said this past week, no new taxes, no new revenues? We gave uh, in legislation governors the power through uh, the 9C section to put the budget in balance and ensure by the end of the fiscal year that the budget will be in balance. We're going to look to see what the governor's proposal is. His team will be drilling down in every single department, every single program, and identify where there is some flexibility. He'll tally it up and he'll bring us a proposal and show us how he's going to get it done. We hope that he'll be able to do it without causing dislocation and causing too much pain, but it's not easy to cut. We know that. Uh, he's a a sensitive and a thoughtful and a, and a strong manager, so I'm confident that he's going to come forward with a, with a very good plan. But do you rule out taxes? I don't think you can rule anything out. I think everything has to be on the table. Taxes are always the last resort, and the second to the last resort is always anything to do with local aid. I, I want to shift the conversation a little bit to, to another issue that you're facing, and it's perhaps, and, and it's our word, if you have a different word, let me know, it's one of credibility because of, of your partner, Brian Hefner. He, after, after assuring your colleagues that there was a firewall between your professional duties, and firewall was your word, between your professional duties and, and your personal life, you brought him into the legislative conference to the Caribbean. The question for you, sir, is was that, was that the right idea? He has his job. I have my job. We're going to do our separate jobs. We are entitled as couples to go on vacation like anyone else. Uh, so you can be assured, as were my colleagues, when they gave me a vote of 34 to 0 in the Democratic caucus, that I can manage my personal life as well as my public life. And uh, in the end, the entire body, 40 to 0, 
voted their uh, confidence in my ability to do no, so. But, but you know how important optics are in government, and just, just the visual of, of the two of you, and you're absolutely right, couples are entitled to go on vacation. That's not the question, but to go from one comment to another, is there, is there do, do the optics say something else? He'll be uh, doing his job, I'll be doing my job. It's ancient history. Um, the fact that there was such scrutiny on you, perhaps maybe this was not the opportunity, the right opportunity. Did you make a mistake having him come along on this conference with you? He and I planned to go on vacation. He was at the resort. He was not at the conference. There were three other legislators whose spouses were with them. They were on vacation. They were not at the conference. It was only my partner who was scrutinized for being at the, confer at the same venue while he was on vacation and I was at work. Uh, moving on to the new governor. You and he worked together across the aisle, or I should say he was at a and You were the Senate Ways and Means Chairman for three years. Um, he's a known political quantity. You know what he's like. Um, he plans to cut the budget and uh, in ways that perhaps do not fit into your political philosophy. For example, uh, he wants to um, deny driver's license to illegal residents. He wants to have... There are a lot of major philosophical differences outside of the budget. Do you see a dividing line where the honeymoon perhaps ends? We will not agree on everything. We will agree on a lot. When we disagree, we will not be disagreeable. And uh, in order to make good law, you have to find common ground and then build solutions. And there are times when uh, we simply will not agree and we'll send legislation to his desk and he will reject it. It will come back to us. And at that point, we'll decide if we want to move forward in which case we would pursue overrides and uh, other times uh, we may find uh, even, even at that point that we can come up with yet a better idea, another form of compromise that will allow us to move forward. Very, uh, just very specifically about the driver's license for illegal residents, where do you stand on that? Would you hold strong on that? It's a public safety issue. We shouldn't be having people on the roads without insurance and without driver's licenses so that if there's a situation that we have identification and ability to uh, make people whole. So you, you think they should? Uh, as most, as most other point. states that have taken this yeah. up, they've approved some form of uh, driver's license so that we can protect the public safety. Are you ready for the OTR pop quiz? Are you ready? Oh. <laughs> Sounds like, are you ready for some football? All right. There we go. This is question one. David Bartley was the House Speaker from Western Massachusetts. Who was the last Senate president to come from the 413 area? Code? Morris Donahue. Of Holyoke, served in the 70s. At the same time as David Bartley. How unusual. Very good. You get extra credit for that. Maybe. Days ago, Charlie Baker. Need it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm telling you, this this win is terrific. Days ago, Charlie Baker was sworn in as the new governor. Governor Baker is now what number as governor in the history of Massachusetts? Ninety-three. Four. Five. <laughs> you're not in the right. <laughs> Ninety-three minus four minus five, and you're still not there. Seventy-two. We can Seventy-two. <laughs> we can oh my with goodness. The, we continue with the Senate president. Stay with us. I think you actually said that this week. <laughs>we are back with the Senate President Stan Rosenberg on the OTR pop, pop quiz. Question three. The estimated cost for the Weld, po, the, uh, the, not Weld, the Baker Polito inaugural.
We continue with the OTR Pop Quiz with the Senate President. The estimated cost for the Baker Polito inaugural is approximately... Not nearly enough. <laughs> you can't say 92 on this one. How much? Do you, uh, give me a number. Not nearly enough, but I assure you there was not one penny of public funds in there. There you go. Spoken brilliantly. 1.6 million big business contributed. 17 top donors gave 25 grand. Former Governor Deval Patrick is being sued by a former state official that he once appointed. Who is that and what is the issue? Oh, it was a commissioner, and I don't remember the issue. Sandra Edwards, a former head sex offender registry board. There you go. Question five. The minimum wage increased on January 1st from 8 to $9. By 2017, when the International Olympic Committee will decide whether or not the Olympics will be here, it'll rise to $11 an hour. It'll be the highest in the nation. Approximately how many Bay State workers earn minimum wage? Oh, it's several hundred thousand. I'm going to say 200,000. It's, it's, yeah, it, 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 yeah, 280 is exact, but you're right there. You're at 280,000 yeah. make about 9% of the state's workforce. You are off the hot seat, sir. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, that's Edward? always the hardest part of the show, isn't it? <laughs> you sail right through it. I think you got three right plus the bonus. That, uh, plus the bonus. Plus the yeah, bonus points. Offering. That's All what right. I'm saying. Exactly. Right. Hey, and the last time we were here on redistricting, and uh, Mike Moran and I did it together, yeah. and we got yeah. uh, all five. Yeah, Look at that. that wasn't was that because bad. of Mike Moran, or was that okay. because of you? Um, <laughs> we were a great team, by the way. He was terrific working, working on that with me. You've been um, a legislative leader. You've been in the Senate, le uh, one of the Senate leaders for a very long time. So you know how long the state has debated the casino issue. Now Boston Mayor Marty Walsh, your former colleague, is suing the state over the Everett license. Do you think Walsh is right to do this? Do you think he has, this was the right thing for him to do? I think the Gaming Commission has a really, really tough job. And uh, in this situation, since the land is just right on the border of the city, uh, it's not surprising to me that there is a, a court challenge coming up. And by the way, this won't be the last court challenge we'll see around gaming. So uh, I think he's got a, uh, I think he's got a tough case to make. But uh, you know, uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. The city will be impacted, and he's looking to make sure that his city gets the help that it needs. Is there, is there, is there? I don't know what the word is, but the fact that the, that the voters of Massachusetts have voted for casino gambling and again last November again stated their preference, and the fact that there isn't a place to go yet, is that an issue in the state here? Actually, no. It's a sign that we are approaching this exactly as we wanted to, which it needs to be with extreme caution and care because. Uh, gambling, entering, uh, cas bringing casinos and slot parlors into the state is a very, very serious thing. And if you look at many other states, the amount of corruption that you see is extraordinary and it's rampant. We have created what is the toughest regulatory scheme in the country to try to ensure that we have integrity in the system. And we built a firewall around the Gaming Commission so they won't, we won't have political interference in the decisions as to who gets the licenses and where, the, where these uh, facilities are sited. So the system is working exactly as it's designed. Once those facilities are open, they're going to be operating for decades. Mr. President, thank you for joining us. My we pleasure. greatly appreciate it. Thank Happy you. New Year. Thank you for joining us on OTR. Our Senate President, Stanley Rosenberg, has been with us, and we appreciate the, the opportunity to talk to him this morning. Coming up next, OTR's Ted Reinstein gets on his soapbox. What are you saying about the new Charlie Baker era? Well, I think it'll be really interesting to um, have a Republican governor. For a change. For a change.